Hello, good afternoon. Welcome back to the OECD Green Growth and Sustainable Development Forum. This year we are focusing on a green recovery, rethinking the built environment and transport. And then in this fourth session, we'll be focusing on green and medium and long distance transport uh, sector. Uh, now, I would like to um, pass over to our esteemed uh, chair or moderator for this session. But before that, a couple of our uh, logistical announcements. We do have a uh, French interpretation uh, between French and English as a bilingual event. So please, you can make use of the uh, translation button on your Zoom if you're joining us online. And also, one more reminder, we have sent or will be sending very soon a participant survey for this conference. We were very keen to hear from you what you thought of the sessions, uh, quality of the discussion, the panelists and the material. So please do uh, take part in this survey when you get a chance. And finally, we also have a Q&A um, session uh, at the end of the panel uh, round. And you can pose your question in the Q&A box available in your Zoom for those of us joining online. So without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Yagoda Egland. She is currently serving as the strategic advisor to the Secretary General of International Transport Forum, which is a, a transport experts under the OECD family here. So over to you, to Yagoda, to introduce the session and our esteemed panel of speakers. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kumi, for this great introduction and for uh, reminding us of the logistical details, which are indeed very important. And thank you also to you and all of your colleagues uh, at the OECD Environment Directorate for inviting uh, the ITF to join this excellent event. We have one and a half hours ahead of us to discuss best practices, key knowledge gaps, and potential future work priorities to help green the aviation sector. The organizers asked us to address three high-level policy questions um, uh, today, um, and here they are. First, what are the benefits and challenges of national policy action to green aviation, and how can we unlock bilateral and multilateral collaboration among countries? The second question is on what innovations are needed for a low-carbon aviation and what are the key barriers to their adoption? And the final question, and also a very interesting one, how can intermodality between air and rail transport be promoted? What will happen over the next one and a half hours? In the session, we will first hear from my colleague and head of the ITF Secretary General's Office, Yari Kaupila, who will deliver uh, a scene setting presentation. And we will then hear a short intervention from each of the panelists invited to join us um, today. This is very much a hybrid event. So most of our panelists joining us via Zoom, but uh, not all. Uh, you can see them on the screen right now, um, I believe. And with us today, we have Marc Ami, the Vice President of Corporate Affairs at Airbus. Mark is joining us from the Airbus headquarters in Toulouse, I can see. Uh, very welcome uh, to you. Uh, Marc. Then Francois Daven um, is the Director General of the International Union of Railways, the UIC. Uh, Francois, you are also joining us remotely and a very, wel welcome, um, very warm welcome to you as well. Kate Hewitt, um, hello Kate, uh, the Deputy Director of the Aviation um, Environment Federation is joining us remotely uh, from London today. Uh, it's great to see you Kate and very warm welcome to you as well. Andras Schaefer is a professor who holds the chair in energy and transport at the Energy Institute of University College London and you could join us here today in Paris, Andreas, which is great and a very warm welcome to you um, also. And finally, last but not least, Jane Hooper, the Deputy Director of Environment at the International Civil Aviation Organization, also known as ICAO, unfortunately couldn't join us today in person or remotely, but she kindly pre-recorded her intervention for us. So we will hear from her um, as well. After we hear the interventions, I will open the floor for discussion by exploring the policy questions prepared for this session by the organizers. But also, and I cannot stress this enough, 
hopefully by giving the floor to you, the audience, here in the OECD auditorium and also remotely um, via Zoom. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to my colleague Yari to set the scene for the event. Thank you, Yari. Thank you very much, Yakoda, and um, thank you very much for our colleagues at the Environment Directory for inviting us again here for this panel. I will give a very, very short introduction to the key challenges of the decarbonizing the uh, not only aviation, but on a longer term, looking at the greening, the medium and long distance transport, um, which is actually uh, quite a lot of that, especially on the tourism side, delivered by cars as well. Uh, to, to start with, and I should have a few slides here to present, um, to start with the demand for regional and intercity travel. This is a number based on our ITF Transport Outlook, our flagship publication, looking at transport demand up to 2050. We project that the medium and long-term travel demand will more than double by 2050, even after pandemic is taken into account on this one. So there's a strong growth in, in travel demand. Uh, this is driven particularly by emerging economies, uh, which are growing still fast, and also by the fact that demand management is a relatively difficult for regional and intercity travel, given the policy options we have available today. This growth in demand will inevitably lead into a growth in CO2 emissions particularly if we do not put in place more ambitious policies as today. With the current policy packages, current policies we've, we've stated policies the governments have put forward, the CO2 emissions will grow nearly by 30, well, uh, by 25% by 2050. So not at all the direction where we want to see for our uh, climate agreement. But we also know that with more ambitious policies put in place, we can and will cut the emissions by nearly 60% by 2050. Here I would say that leveraging from the recovery uh, or from the COVID-19, from the pandemic, is really crucial and can, be a, can really speed up the transition towards uh, decarbonizing the transportation sector. So what are the measures? This is a very high level uh, overview, obviously, and, and putting this into a, a, a traditional avoid shift improve framework, um, we can avoid travel, we can reduce the propensity to fly, we can promote local tourism, encourage teleworking, video conferencing. We have our participants here, not coming all from, from Paris on video. I think these are all the positive outcomes of the pandemic, if there are some. In terms of the behavioral changes, in terms of the way we can continue deliver our work without necessarily traveling to, to destinations. The shift, we can substitute high-speed rail travel for short-haul flights. This is a tendency that is continuing. It needs to be continued stronger. And we can design the recovery packages that help shift travel to more low-carbon mobility. And finally, improve. And I would say specifically for medium long-term transport, the technological improvements offer the most promising path to decarbonize the non-urban uh, passenger transport. Here, I wouldn't forget the road vehicles. Uh, as I mentioned, a lot of the medium distance travel still is done by car. So we need to promote the use of more energy efficient road vehicles, build the infrastructure for those vehicles, encourage uh, new aircraft design, but on the longer term, developing hybrid electric aircraft. There's been positive de developments going on on this side recently. And foremost, increase the use of sustainable aviation fuels, the SAF. Now, diving a little bit deeper into aviation particularly, one of the most hard to abate sectors with the maritime and road freight. Looking at that sector, even after pandemic, and, and aligning a lot with the industry projections and sectoral projections, we project aviation demand to triple by 2050 still. This is a strong growth. It's driven by population growth, by increase in incomes, prosperity, that all drive this demand as we move forward. So this makes it 
a big challenge. And there's been a lot of energy efficiency improvements done in the aviation sector. However, still, the air transport is one of the most energy intensive transport modes. With growth in demand and also limited and costly abatement options and a lack of economic incentives at the moment to decarbonize, this, this really raises the concerns about alignment of the aviation sector to ability to meet the Paris goals. But what we also see is that the emissions trajectory for aviation will depend largely on government policies. And that's a positive note. However, under the current uh, trajectory, we project that the emissions will, will grow by a factor of 2.3 by 2050. But while industry is doing a lot, governments can also have a major role to play. And with the right set of policies, we can cut the aviation emissions to the levels of during the pandemic, in, in COVID, during the, the, the deep of the pandemic in 2020 by 2050. So there is a positive opportunity and possibility for decarbonizing aviation. We did a very recent analytics on specifically focus on decarbonizing air transport and looking at key instruments focused on aircrafts and fuels. And we looked at two elements, reducing the energy need for flying. Here we have energy efficiency improvements, looking at aircraft weight, thermodynamic efficiency, aerodynamic characteristics, etc. And also the alternative propulsion systems I mentioned before, hybrid electric to even to all electric planes. And there's something, a lot has happened, and I'm sure uh, our colleague Andres will talk a little bit about that as we've been discussing electric planes over the years on, on many occasions. But then there's also switch to low carbon fuels the, and other energy vectors, moving from, from fossil energy to processes and feedstocks capable of meeting a number of sustainable requirements. And here we need to stress the point about low greenhouse gas emissions on a, a life cycle assessment uh, basis. So we talk about sustainable electric fuels, electricity, and, and hydrogen. We had several key recommendations in the report for aviation. I'll summarize them very briefly. Uh, first, again, here as well as in other sectors, the recovery from COVID is an opportunity to reshape the transportation sector. It's an opportunity to reshape the aviation sector. Integrating decarbonization into government support packages is one of the key points here. We need to establish a clear long-term vision for decarbonizing air transport and support an international approach done at the moment via ICAO. There's a strong need for governments to support and continue that work, while at the same time uh, implementing decarbonization policies domestically, regionally, bilaterally, multilaterally. This is one of the key recommendations from our side. But more specifically, we need to introduce aviation-specific global carbon price. But we know that there are a lot of challenges in delivering such an agreement, global agreement, given the urgency of reducing CO2 emissions at the moment. So technology policies will be crucial and important here. Regulation on aircraft fuel efficiency, uh, low carbon fuel standards and, or, or blending mandates, or some forms of ticket taxes, and financial instruments that help lower capital cost and to limit some of the risks involved in investment in cleaner aircraft and fuel technologies. But we also need a very direct mission-oriented research and innovation funding to scale up these technology solutions, and we need it urgently. Just want to finish with two uh, slides, what we at the ITF are doing or, or, or will be doing in terms of, of meeting these challenges. The first is our Transport Climate Action Directory. This is a catalog of effective mitigation measures that is available online that we hope helps policymakers to deliver on decarbonizing goals with quantitative evidence on effectiveness of different policy measures in reducing CO2 emissions. This is uh, just ahead of COP, just came back from COP last week, where a lot of obviously transportation discussions took place. We updated our directory with 
specifically aviation type of measures, and I invite you all look at these. And, and we're very proud of this work. It is endorsed by the UNFCCC as the tool for transportation sector to decarbonize. Yeah. And finally, another project I just want to mention briefly is our Driving Implementation Actions project. This is a project funded by European Commission. Uh, it builds an international coalition to scale up innovative solutions for hard to abate sectors. We want to understand what are the solutions, what are the actions we can take now, and how we can really scale up them in the short term. We focus on the uh, heavy-duty road freight, aviation, maritime, and we're very pleased we have more than 30 countries who've joined this coalition together with global companies and research institutes to really tackle these questions with a very short time frame. Uh, time frame. For aviation, we have 15 countries on board um, and all the major players are there. Uh, also, uh, aviation industry is involved and we will be focusing on sustainable aviation fuels, what works best for bringing these uh, fuels to the markets as soon as possible. So with that, I will leave this opening remarks. I hope it gives an overview of some of the challenges on the medium and long-term travel and decarbonizing and specifically aviation. And I look forward for our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yari, for this very comprehensive um, uh, high-level overview of the decarbonization challenge, uh, also focusing on the opportunities that are um, available. You picked up on many points there, and I'm sure that we'll get back uh, to discussing them in greater details. And indeed, I have seen Andreas taking quite a few notes when you were speaking, so I'm sure we will uh, talk about uh, some of the assumptions underpinning um, ITF um, uh, work as well. So thank you again for setting um, the scene. I will now ask the organizers um, to play an intervention by Jane, who will be speaking on behalf of the International Civil Aviation Organization. It is my great honor to be part of this event. First, allow me to emphasize that aviation, and in particular international aviation, has been one of the sectors hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. ICAO and its member states are already engaged on a green recovery for international civil aviation, as we believe that like any other sector, aviation must do its part in reducing its CO2 emissions. And the post-COVID period provides aviation with a tremendous opportunity to build back better and to transform air travel by embracing the latest innovation in technology operations and fuels. Let me tell you about what ICAO is doing to support this collective effort. Since the adoption of the ICAO Carbon Neutral Growth Target for 2020, more than 10 years ago, the sector has made substantial progress. Aviation technologies have delivered greater levels of fuel efficiency, operations have been better optimized, sustainable aviation fuels, SAF, have been developed and deployed in an unprecedented pace, and ICAO has established CORSIA, Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. I'm very pleased to be able to provide you with the latest news on SAF in Corsia. Just last week, the ICAO Council approved the sustainability criteria for Corsia Sustainable Aviation Fuel, SAF, including additional teams and associated guidance on how the compliance with the criteria should be assessed. The agreement complements the initially agreed sustainable criteria for GHG emissions and now encompasses a broader range of environmental and socioeconomic criteria, representing the first global sustainability approach for an industry sector. This is great news. It is clear that aviation must go green and we must accelerate the pace of progress from research and development to the rapid implementation of the latest innovations and practices to deal with aviation climate impact. Fortunately, aviation pioneers are moving fast. During recent events organized by ICAO in the areas of innovation and the environment, namely the ICAO stock taking, we have witnessed an extraordinary mobilization by states, industry, entrepreneurs, civil society towards aviation decarbonization. Strong commitments, ambitious roadmaps, and dozens of climate solutions were showcased. Net zero goals by 2050, disruptive technologies such as electric and hydrogen aircraft, sustainable and carbon-free fuels, all these recent announcements are very encouraging. 
The IKEA Sustainable Aviation Coalition was created to bring the stakeholders together and enhance further cooperation. I invite new partners to join the coalition and I encourage you to go to the IKEA website to see our innovation trackers on emissions reductions. At its fourth year session in 2019, the IKEA Assembly requested the IKEA Council to continue to explore the feasibility of a climate long-term global aspirational goal for international aviation, namely LTAG. IKEA has continuously worked to that end, and in particular to the work of a dedicated multi-stakeholder multi technical process. Numerous information on the latest and most ambitious innovations and CO2 reduction opportunities have been collected and possible implementation roadmaps are currently being assessed by 200 of the best experts in the world in this area. The outcomes of this work will be presented to the 41st session of the IKEA Assembly next year in September, 2022 for IKEA's 193 member states consideration. The pandemic has changed the way many will travel. Youth in particular aspire for new forms of travel, more sustainable and responsible. Expectations are high. I'm happy to say that IKEA is encouraging the participation of youth in this process by supporting youth to form an independent umbrella group. We want to hear their views and solutions for aviation's green transition. I believe aviation is up for its largest challenge, the climate one. IKEA stands ready to set the course for aviation's decarbonization and we will co continue to facilitate cooperation and action. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jane, for this excellent overview of what aviation stakeholders have achieved and indeed the plans ahead and for sharing with us indeed great news on the progress with the sustainability criteria for Corsia. In her intervention, Jane mentioned uh, aviation pioneers who are moving fast, and we are lucky to have one of these pioneers with us today. Uh, Mark, if, you can, uh, if I can turn to you, uh, this forum is focusing on green recovery. So from Airbus's perspective, in what green projects have you been involved? And are there uh, any that have started during the uh, pandemic? And the floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, what I would like to say first is yes, uh, during this pandemic, you know, it was a, a very difficult crisis for uh, international aviation. We've, uh, we all have decided to uh, build that back better, to, 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 to build a, a green recovery a better recovery. And the result, probably you know it, is that the whole aviation sector is now committed to uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. This decision uh, has been made by all the uh, members of the international uh, organization IATA last October, and it has been followed by uh, a declaration of ATAG so the whole aviation industry, recouped in ITAG, with manufacturers and navigation services, airport and airlines, with the same uh, engagement to be carbon neutral in, uh, in 2050. So this is a great achievement despite the difficulty of recovering for, from this crisis. And as Airbus, of course, we want to lead this transformation. And uh, as you probably know, uh, we have decided, and it was last year, so. Uh, uh, during the pandemic uh, to launch a very ambitious project, which is to uh, work on three projects of uh, zero emission air aircraft, hydrogen aircraft from 100 to 200 passengers uh, for a range from one nautical mile to 2000 uh, nautical miles to be able to introduce it to the market in 2035, zero emission aircraft propulsed by hydrogen and with no CO2 emission at all. So this is one of the uh, most important decisions we, we, we have taken during this pandemic and, uh, and uh, uh, that should allow uh, a big step uh, in, in the decarbonization of air transport in, in the near period. This is only one. Uh, the other one was also mentioned by, uh, 
that the experiment intervention before me. So to go faster on sustainable aviation fuel, uh, we are preparing our aircraft to be capable for uh, using 100% uh, SAF. Today, they, they are qualified for 50% uh, uh, SAF uptake. Tomorrow, they will be able to, to, to have a, an uptake of 100% uh, SAF. And uh, this SAF can be, including for the fuel rank aircraft, to uh, reduce uh, emission up to uh, 80%. And of course, we will continue to improve the efficiency of our aircraft. Uh, today, the last generation is improving uh, the performance and so the reducing the emission by 20, 25%. We still have uh, some potential progress to go further um, and, and so on. So uh, I think uh, this difficult period was really an opportunity to be part of, of the uh, recovery of the economy with an approach towards sustainability. And this has been made with, with states. As an example, we are part uh, of, of the French plan towards 2030, uh, supporting SAF and new technology. But this is also true uh, in Europe, of course, uh, in Germany, in the US, everywhere in the world, we can see this evolution. And aviation is really fully integrated uh, in this uh, green recovery with the clear willingness to go to carbon neutrality in 2050. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And indeed, this is a very difficult time for the aviation industry. So it's very encouraging to see these fantastic new initiatives uh, coming on stream. I will now turn to uh, Francois who is representing the rail sector at today's panel. Um, Francois, from your point of view, to what extent um, can shift to rail um, help reduce carbon emissions from long distance transport? And also, how has pandemic affected uh, long distance rail travel? Are there any particular green recovery measures that governments could deploy to support rail travel to help reduce overall emissions from long-term transport. Over to you. Okay, thank you very much. So I understand there is a translation. So in order to, uh, to have the interpreters working, I will continue to express in French. Uh, uh, oui, je, je, effectivement, la, la, la période de, de la COVID a été extrêmement difficile également pour le secteur du transport ferroviaire, puisqu'en fait, on a eu des baisses qui sont allées jusqu'à moins 40% en termes de, de revenus et jusqu'à moins 60% en termes de, en termes de trafic, tout ça sur, sur le monde entier, évidemment aussi en Europe. Euh, par contre, je pense que l'effet positif pour nous a été de faire comprendre euh, globalement au gouvernement et euh, à nos concitoyens que euh, le rail a tenu, notamment euh, en termes d'approvisionnement. Euh, le fret ferroviaire a été très peu touché parce qu'en fait, euh, évidemment, vous avez un seul conducteur pour en train de 40, 50, et quelques wagons. Donc, il a été euh, difficile, mais possible, euh, d'organiser la continuité de l'approvisionnement avec le fret ferroviaire. Donc, du coup, euh, la baisse de trafic a été relativement faible, en train de l'ordre de 10%, et on n'est toujours pas complètement revenu à la normale, mais en tout cas, le fret ferroviaire a montré euh, sa résilience. Ce qu'on a montré également, c'est que euh, dans la période où euh, les, euh, les personnes qui avaient des métiers essentiels pour faire tenir notre société, eh bien, le transport euh, public a tenu, puisqu'en fait, ces gens-là ont été euh, transportés par les métros, par les bus, etc., donc par l'ensemble du, du secteur. Donc, au, au niveau du, du transport ferroviaire, euh, bah, à vrai dire, nous, on est déjà en transport, transport qui est quand même assez décarboné. Hein. Si on prend l'exemple européen, on représente 8% du trafic de passagers, plus de 19% du trafic de fret, et on représente 0,5% des émissions. Donc, euh, pour les émissions du transport qui représentent globalement 30% des émissions. Donc, à vrai dire, le, le transport ferroviaire est déjà en, en transport en très grande partie décarboné. Donc nous, ce dont nous avons besoin, c'est euh, à vrai dire qu'on ait de la part euh, des gouvernements et des politiques publiques euh, l'idée assez nette euh, qu'il faut aller vers un changement de paradigme. Si on prend un exemple très simple, on change d'aller chercher d'innovation euh, extraordinaire, puisque le trafic ferroviaire est aujourd'hui, alors c'est le point en gros du mix électrique, euh, 5 à 10 fois euh, plus efficace en termes d'énergie que tout autre mode de transport. 
Si on imaginait au niveau global, donc au niveau global, le transport, c'est 23% des émissions, hein, si on disait qu'au niveau global, on shift un tiers euh, du transport vers le ferroviaire, ben, ça réduit l'ensemble des émissions de 25% si on est euh, au niveau moyen des émissions mondiales aujourd'hui pour le transport ferroviaire. Et si on se met d'ici, mettons, 10 ans, au niveau d'efficacité de l'Europe, ça le réduirait de 28%. C'est-à-dire qu'en fait, quasiment l'ensemble du trafic qui serait... Euh, shifté euh, vers le rail, euh, atterrirait en réduction nette euh, des émissions de carbone. Donc, c'est des chiffres très simples, mais c'est des chiffres également très réels. Donc, euh, si on rajoute encore deux, trois chiffres, euh, le déplacement moyen aujourd'hui euh, en France, c'est de l'ordre de 15 km. Donc, euh, ça veut dire que normalement, on doit pouvoir arriver à un mix de transport euh, qui doit être capable de faire beaucoup plus de parts euh, au transport public, euh, à la marche, au vélo, euh, évidemment au ferroviaire, euh, et beaucoup moins de parts euh, aux véhicules individuels. De la même façon, euh, si on parle également de cette nécessité d'avoir du report modal, euh, on peut imaginer euh, à travers plus d'investissements dans les infrastructures ferroviaires qu'on développe la capacité euh, de notre mode de transport de façon évidemment à avoir euh, à terme euh, une, un report modal extrêmement important. Bon, je crois que c'est un peu ça euh, que le Dura nous demande. Alors, l'idée importante là-dessus, c'est que, euh, évidemment, pour ça, il faut que ce soit désirable. Alors, quand, quand, quand je le dis comme ça, ça veut dire qu'il faut que nos concitoyens euh, et nos clients aient vraiment une satisfaction à, à avoir ce, ce changement d'attitude, ce changement de paradigme. Alors ça, ça veut dire qu'il faut qu'on soit capable euh, d'avoir de bien meilleures interconnexions notamment avec le monde de l'aviation. Par exemple, l'UIC aujourd'hui travaille avec l'IATA pour avoir des systèmes de billetterie communs, de façon à ce qu'effectivement, ben, un long courrier qui arrive à Paris ben, puisse être relié très facilement euh, par le système ferroviaire, que ce soit à Paris, à Berlin ou à Pékin. Donc, on est vraiment des, des interconnexions extrêmement fortes. Que ces interconnexions euh, extrêmement fortes marchent aussi à travers euh, ben, le, le réseau des intercités, le réseau de, de la haute vitesse et les réseaux de transport public. Donc ça, c'est quelque chose sur lequel on est en train de travailler avec de, de nouveaux produits euh, au niveau de l'UIC, avec un nouveau euh, produit pour la distribution et la vente de tickets, donc ça s'appelle OSDM, en français dans le texte, c'est Open, euh, Open Sales and Distribution Model, qui est capable justement de faire cette intégration euh, entre l'aviation, euh, le transport ferroviaire et le transport public. Donc, la direction, c'est vraiment d'être capable d'avoir des innovations, euh, j'allais dire, assez rapides, euh, de pouvoir, d'ici dix ans, euh, avoir vraiment un concept euh, de système des transports où le ferroviaire et le transport public soient vraiment euh, l'épine dorsale, le backbone, comme on dit également en bon français, de la mobilité. Alors aujourd'hui, on n'est évidemment pas encore, c'est-à-dire qu'avec euh, une part modale globale du ferroviaire de 8% au niveau mondial, on est loin d'être en backbone. Et l'idée, c'est d'aller vers cela. Donc, en termes de politique publique, évidemment, euh, c'est du soutien euh, à la recherche et au développement, j'allais dire davantage au développement qu'à la recherche, parce que euh, les solutions sont là. C'est-à-dire qu'au niveau du transport ferroviaire, donc je ne rentrerai pas dans le détail, mais il est tout à fait possible d'imaginer de décarboner complètement euh, le transport médium et longue distance d'ici 2030, mais pas sur des horizons de 2050 ni 2040, mais sur des horizons beaucoup plus proches pour, euh, pour la longue distance. Donc, ce dont nous avons besoin, c'est justement d'une aide à euh, cette interconnexion. Également d'une aide euh, sur euh, avoir plus d'infrastructures, parce qu'évidemment, euh, ce n'est pas avec l'infrastructure d'aujourd'hui qu'on sera capable d'avoir un report modal massif vers le ferroviaire. Donc, il va falloir effectivement investir euh, davantage dans ce type de monde. Donc, ça, ça veut dire, bon, pas forcément rentrer dans les détails, mais ça veut dire qu'à euh, un moment, le fait que le, le mode ferroviaire associé au transport public. Je pense que là-dessus, on essaie de travailler en étroite collaboration avec les acteurs du transport public, et en particulier avec l'UITP. Le fait qu'on ait un très faible taux d'émission fait qu'on devrait être favorisé par le fait qu'on a des externalités très faibles. Globalement, ça veut dire qu'au niveau des politiques publiques, il faudra arriver à une tarification des externalités négatives pour encore un bon bouton des autres modes de transport. Voilà, j'espère avoir été clair.
Thank you very much, Francois. And I can confirm that our interpreters did a fantastic job translating um, French into English. Uh, so uh, well done. Um, I have to work a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and thank you very much for explaining uh, the relevance of the shift uh, uh, to rail for decarbonizing aviation. And the numbers you quoted there are uh, quite staggering, very ambitious, and I'm sure we'll unpack some of these numbers as well uh, during the panel um, uh, discussion. And, and thank you also uh, for um, highlighting what governments could do in order to help uh, the shift uh, to rail. And we'll get uh, back to that, I'm sure, um, uh, as well. So I will now uh, turn to Kate. Uh, Kate, uh, we have already heard uh, from uh, Yari um, that uh, our CO2 future for aviation is very dependent on policies that governments may or may not decide on. Um, most of the sector decarbonization pathways are based on ambitious assumptions towards uptake of green technologies. So um, I wanted to ask you, how realistic do you think these assumptions are? Do you think we can get there on time? And has COP26 changed anything in this respect? Over to you, Kate. Okay. Um, there's a lot to talk about here. And, uh, you know, some of these things I'm sure we can um, look into in more detail when we come to look at the sort of specific policy interventions. Um, but um, by way of sort of general, uh, you know, general introduction, I, so I'm, I'm from the Aviation Environment Federation, we're a UK-based uh, not-for-profit organisation campaigning on uh, aviation's impacts for people and the environment. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of recovery, uh, because we're talking today about recovery, um, but the idea fundamentally is that you're returning something to good health. And I, I think that we need to be clear that actually before the pandemic, aviation was in poor shape in terms of um, its environmental impact. And that's for several reasons. So first, it was powered almost entirely by fossil fuel. And unlike uh, many sectors in OECD countries, its emissions were going up and not down. Um, noise impacts, which uh, are increasingly seen as a public health issue, uh, were problematic, particularly in the context of uh, airspace change, potentially concentrating uh, noise over um, a small number of people. And the demand levels and profits from aviation, uh, we would argue, were being propped up by tax breaks and by weak uh, carbon pricing. The other notable feature about uh, the aviation sector was that um, its emissions came actually from a very small proportion of the global population. So aviation emissions globally were over 900 million tonnes per year. That's more than twice those of the entire uh, UK economy. But more, more than half of that CO2 was uh, generated by just 1% of the global population, mainly from wealthy countries and only 4% of the world's population flew internationally at all in a given year. Um, until now, the uh, sort of typical response to that inequity in access to air travel by both governments and the industry has been to argue in favor of cheaper flying. Uh, but if we continue to prioritize more flying over cutting CO2, uh, then emissions will rise and will continue to accumulate in the atmosphere because there is currently no such thing as green flying. The sector's a very long way from achieving that. Um, it, politicians sometimes say things like, I, I really believe that innovation in fuels and technology is going to solve the aviation emissions challenge. And it, it reminds me a little bit of uh, my daughter's firm belief that vegetables are not required for human health and that what 11 year olds really need is unlimited sugar. No amount of expert evidence or scientific uh, uh, you know, views will, will sway her opinion because that's what she wants to believe. That there is no credible evidence that net zero aviation by 2050, which is the goal, uh, as we've heard, that the industry itself has now committed to, can be achieved while allowing unlimited demand growth. So there are some uh, technologies that could theoretically be deployed and uh, we're, we're gonna talk about them for sure a lot in this session. Um, and we can come back to the potential and, and limits of, of SAP in particular. But we need to be honest about what can be done in the next three decades and about what that's going to cost. Um, <clears throat> so what in our view do, do, do we think governments and others 
uh, should be doing. Uh, they should be focusing on how to meet people's needs to go on holiday, to do business, to feel globally connected as far as possible without flying. Um, they should be holding the industry to account for its emissions. So alongside the uh, ICAO goal setting process, aviation emissions should be included uh, in GCs and in national climate legislation. They should stop expanding airports unless that can be shown to be compatible with those uh, national targets. Uh, they need to be offering support to staff who are facing uh, job losses in aviation um, but with opportunities for retraining in, in sustainable employment. Um, and, you know, as we've heard already several times, they need to be internalizing the cost of decarbonizing aviation into ticket prices. Um, so finally, you mentioned the COP. Uh, there are two, two things I'm going to suggest that we need to take from the COP. First, that there is an urgent need for increased climate ambition compared with co what countries are currently offering. Um, and, and that's really relevant for aviation. And secondly, that we can't wait for 2050, that we need to be looking at nearer term dates like 2030. Um, and in aviation, we shouldn't be allowing emissions to rise uh, beyond their pre-pandemic level. Thank you very much, um, Kate. And as you said, we will go back to unpacking um, uh, many points that you made there uh, in, in our uh, discussion. Um, Andreas. The last word in the round of interventions is yours. Uh, we heard from Yari about uh, the significant expected growth of aviation to 2050. We also um, heard that policy is important. Then we heard from Kate that many of these assumptions will be very challenging to meet. What is your view on the rise of air travel? Um, is what you see consistent with uh, our work here uh, at the ITF, and what are your emissions projections for the sector? What do they hinge on? Over to you. Thanks, uh, Jagoda. As always, it's a pleasure to, to be in your um, you know, workshops and conferences. Um, well, um, you know, you heard Yari giving his, you know, his, his presentation, which I found quite insightful, and, and guess what, um, the, uh, you know, baseline projections that he outlined, namely I think a factor of 3.1 in terms of travel demand over 2015 is uh, exactly in line with our central scenario, what we anticipate. And, and Yaro, Yari already uh, you know, mentioned some of the key drivers, namely growth in population and particularly growth in income. In addition to that, of course, is you know, the reduction in tickets, ticket prices as you would uh, anticipate. In, in the absence of any environmental legislation, of course. And, you know, um, you would assume that the airport capacities you need are going to be deployed, uh, otherwise you would constrain growth. Um, in terms of CO2 emissions, well, you know, if, if you continue as, as we did in the past, and I fully agree that's unsustainable, then our emissions would continue to rise too, and I'm talking about CO2 emissions now. And um, based on our projections, uh, depending on the economic growth and uh, you know other assumptions, um, these uh, could grow by 50 to 150 percent over 2019 levels. It's also very much in line to what Yari presented in, in one of the scenarios. And, and then the challenge is, what can you do about it? And, and um, I completely agree with what has been said before. It's a massive challenge to get the emissions already down in absolute terms and then meeting uh, 2050 net zero targets, particularly if you don't um, take advantage of any offsets. This makes it extremely difficult. I wouldn't say it's possible. I would say it's not impossible just to manage the expectations. And, and we heard the whole menu of, of uh, you know, technological options that you need to implement. Of course, it's fuel efficiency improvements. Now, these will happen anyway because the, the industry is driven by direct operating cost reductions and fuel has been the, the dominant component, uh, cost component of, of the expenditures, of the airline expenditures. And, and they will continue to happen also significantly. The game changer, although there's no silver bullet, but the game changer is what has been alluded to also by Mark and others, is the availability of zero carbon fuels, which have to be scaled up dramatically and the associated barriers have to be overcome. And we need to do this 
now and the, the associated investments, uh, investment capital investment requirements based on our simulations suggest that you are easily in the trillions of dollars and they compare to the GDP of large industrialized countries, whether it's France, uh, Germany, or the UK. Um, so it's a massive challenge. And um, you know, again, uh, particularly because none of the game-changing technologies that we need to implement quickly exists, at, at least doesn't exist at scale. And this makes it even more complicated. On, on this positive note, I, I, um, I give the floor back to you, Jagoda. Thank you very much, um, Andreas, and um, um, thank, uh, thank you again to all the panelists for their excellent interventions and for, uh, to Yari for setting the scene. Um, I will now open the floor for discussion, um, and I would like to give the audience here in Paris, as well uh, on Zoom, some time to think about the questions, and I've already seen a couple, uh, so we'll get back to those. Uh, in the meantime, I would like to use my moderator's privileges, if that's okay, and ask my own question um, uh, to the panel. Um, so, with the COVID-19 pandemic, and we've already talked about this, the industry found itself in possibly the worst crisis to date. Many governments stepped in to help the sector recover. And in this forum uh, at the OECD, w the focus really is on green recovery. So I would like to explore a little bit what challenges and possibly opportunities had the pandemic brought to the sector on the decarbonization front. And I know that we've alluded to this um, a, a lot already. So Andreas, you already talked a little bit about uh, the, the projections and the figures um, for the future. So has the pandemic already brought some positive green trends, you think? So not the short-term ones that are obvious, so we stopped flying for a while and now we are um, uh, rebounding, but any long-term trends that you really think will emerge as a result? I think it's very difficult to say. Um, so far, well, the immediate benefits for the environment, of course, were that people could not fly to the extent at least they did before. Um, as we heard also before, the aviation industry, the entire value chain, uh, not only the manufacturers, so the airlines, the airports, they, they got hammered by the, by the pandemic. And um, so it's, it's difficult to see any, any um, you know, direct benefit. Uh, there is a benefit in, in terms of the economic uh, you know, rescue packages that have been uh, made available to the industry. And, and one of the rescue packages, I believe, was Mark was referring to, namely the, you know, attention that was paid at Airbus with respect to hydrogen aircraft. I'm, I'm not sure whether this level of attention would have been paid towards, you know, these game-changing technologies in the absence of the pandemic or the health, the, you know, the, the rescue packages. Um, Yari already mentioned also, you know, this, these uh, online conferences seem to be uh, uh, much more manageable than we thought they would be before the pandemic. But, but that may only be a sort of a short-term first-order effect. You know, you meet new people and, and you thought, oh, you know, gee, if I, if I was there, I could, have, I could have connected with that person much easier. So at the next opportunity, I may actually take the plane and, and, and travel there. So, so I think it's, it's too early to, to tell whether we can see any direct benefits, longer term benefits from the pandemic itself. All right, and uh, Kate, if I can turn to you um, uh, via Zoom, you said that we need to ensure that we do many things that we need to do without using planes in order to decarbonize. We, of course, um, uh, have uh, changed the ways in which we live and work uh, under the pandemic. Do you think these trends are here to stay? Uh, and uh, how can we perhaps uh, make them stay for longer with us? Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting things um, about the impact of the pandemic um, it is that actually the level of sort of climate concern among uh, the public um, and among businesses um, doesn't seem to have been dimmed. You know, that obviously we had this massive global problem that sort of really changed all of our lives. 
um, in so many ways uh, and w w was a big kind of concern, but actually people's um, uh, belief that we, we must, uh, you know, continue to act on climate change sort of remained, remained steady throughout uh, the period. Um, and I think that um, the impact on sort of business travel is something that we shouldn't underestimate. I mean, <laughs> pre-pandemic, one of our kind of uh, messages as an organization was to say, um, you know, you, you shouldn't overestimate how much business travel there is, but actually certainly in the UK, there was evidence that there was um, a sort of flatlining of business travel demand. So the idea that, for example, we have to have uh, a new runway at Heathrow in order to cater for, for business travellers was not well substantiated by the evidence. Um, that main, the growth in traffic in, in air traffic seemed to be coming much more actually from, uh, from leisure uh, passengers. Um, however, I think that a lot of businesses were just kind of on the cusp uh, before the pandemic of recognizing that within their own operations, they were making their own net zero con you know, commitments as a company, as a, as a bank, whatever. Um, and that their own air travel was increasingly standing out as something that um, you, you know, was difficult, as we all recognize, it was, was difficult to cut um, and where they knew they needed to do something. <laughs> And I think the fact that we have, you know, we've now, um, as we've said already, many of us got used to working in different ways and connecting in different ways, um, certainly for some of that travel uh, might help to sort of facilitate those ch changes that I think a lot of businesses felt needed to happen anyway. Um, and uh, that it, it, you don't need to lo lose very many business travelers from a flight for it to have really quite a significant impact on the kind of um, economics of operating that flight. So, um, it, you know, because a lot of the profits uh, to, to, to airlines come from uh, business travel rather than from leisure, um, it could have a sort of bigger impact. It could have ripples actually in terms of um, the, the sort of economics of operating uh, flights um, be, beyond those of just kind of business, business travel itself. Um, that sounds a bit negative <laughs> way to end. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something more positive. Um, I, mean, I, I suppose uh, as well, I think that the idea of actually, uh, I would like to think that the idea of going on holiday kind of domestically a bit closer to home uh, maybe is something that uh, uh, has occurred to people in, in a different way um, as a result of the pandemic and that, you know, may, maybe uh, that's something that, that will be useful to build on, that actually you don't have to go to the other side of the world to get a nice beach, you know, that you, you, you can do that by traveling um, more sustainably over land. Indeed. Um, Mark, uh, in the hope of looking for positive uh, examples, uh, would you like to tell us more about how green recovery for the sector looks in France? Uh, no, Yagoda, first I would like to make some comments on what have just been said. Uh, of course, we have a different approach um, during the pandemic and the stress of fern. But uh, millions of people in the world suffered to be far away from their families, from their relatives. You know, 300 million people are living today outside the countries they were born. And uh, we can see today with the possibility to travel again, an absolutely need for these people to see their fathers, their grandfathers, to, to meet their uh, children and, and meet again. And uh, this shows the utility of uh, the aviation today, air transport. Uh, climate is a real threat for the future, but nationalisms are also a threat for the future. And we do think that their transport uh, is useful for a better understanding of people on, on this earth, for exchange, uh, better understanding of the different culture, of the different people. So it's a way of unifying the world and it's very important. You know, today aviation is representing only 3% of the global emission on the earth. So we don't believe that the solution is to stop flying. We do believe that the solution is to fly without emission. And uh, it was said before that we have to shift to train, but if you are able to provide a fly with zero emission, which is our objective, you don't need new infrastructure investment. 
you don't have any impact on the lands. And you can allow these people to keep on trying in perfect respect of the planet. This is really our ambition. This is a very uh, enthusiastic, perhaps challenging ambition, but this is our ambition. And uh, we do believe because it's not just a wish. Uh, we have uh, today in Airbus hundreds of people working on that. Probably the most qualified people in the world on aviation. We are investing billions of euros in that. So we do believe that uh, this is worth working on that and allowing the next generation to keep on flying in the perfect respect of the planet. Um, <laughs> I think it's important to say that. Uh, it's not because I am uh, coming from aviation. I think uh, flying is today part of our life. Uh, there are 8,000 city pairs directly connected by, by a flight in Europe. This is the best way to unify Europe, etc., etc. So uh, uh, this is my message today. <laughs> I understand that uh, sometimes uh, a lot of people are seeing aviation as not the right way to fly. Uh, but look at the performance, uh, much better than a car today. And, and look at the future and the possibility to have a transport which is fully integrated in the objective of the Paris Agreement and the objective to offer a green mobility to people. This is, I think, the challenge for all transport, car, trucks, bus, maritime transport, will all have the, the, the same challenge. And when I say the whole aviation sector is committed to car carbon neutrality in 2050, and of course we will move uh, before that. Uh, I said the objective of Airbus to deliver this uh, zero emission aircraft by 2035, and we will start using uh, sustainable aviation fuel before to limit the emissions. And look at the ATAG waypoint 2050. You will see that there is a trajectory to go there. There, is solution, there are solutions. Yes, there are needed investment, but it's not specific for aviation. 80% of the energy on Earth is coming today from fossil fuel. Globally, for the global economy, we have to shift from 80% fossil fuel to new sources of energy. And this is why, as an example, we are looking for hydrogen, because hydrogen will be the main uh, way of transporting decarbonized energy. Uh, and to use this energy, we go zero emission. So this is something which <laughs> is a really uh, step change in aviation, as we need a step change in the global economy. And we just want to be part of it uh, with uh, uh, a really a full engagement of, of aviation. So I think this is what should be on, on the table today for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. And undeniably, aviation does bring us many connectivity benefits. And if uh, uh, I think uh, it was quite clear during the pandemic when we didn't have uh, access to that connectivity, uh, how painful that has been uh, to our economies um, and to our societies. But I think you know what 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 ha what has been said already is very linked to one of the questions that we received from our audience, um, and the question is, what do you think of uh, fleececam in Swedish or in English flight shaming? Um, uh, Yari, would you like to try to answer that question, putting you on the spot there? Thank you very much for that, <laughs> putting me on that spot. Um, I, I think going back to what Mark was saying about that, that people need to travel and, and, and sort of people travel for purpose. I mean, th there's, there's an access to opportunities, access to jobs, to families, to healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. The people find value from going from one place to another. Um, so I think, I think uh, putting in that into that context, what the flight shame or flugscham has uh, brought forward perhaps is an awareness of the choice that when you travel what type of choices you're going to make and what are the implications of that choice so perhaps just top of my head I would say awareness building about the impact of that decision that you make of taking that flight um, has increased among among the consumers I think and um, and, and I think this is the type of uh, behavioral change that is required, and uh, other speakers, uh, Kate was talking about that need as well, 
uh, that how we travel and, and what choices we make, I think those are crucially as important as the, um, the decisions and the solutions we find from the technology side. So they definitely, definitely brought that type of a, a point forward. I just want to talk about a little bit about that um, local tourism point that was made as well. Um, I would agree with, with, with Andreas that it's quite early to say whether some of the local tourism boost that we saw is really a result of a, a, a behavioral change, a change in the way we, we really do things, or is it perhaps a built-up demand as a result of household savings, not being able to travel, and also a result of the restrictions that are still there. Um, so it, it, it's, it's really early times, but um, I think these are the key questions in that in the, in, the, in the question of behavioral change that are really needed as well. Thanks, Yari. And sorry again about putting you on the spot there, but you're from the Nordics, so I thought Liskam was a perfect question uh, for you. Um, Francois, considering uh, everything that has been already said, is this the right time uh, to promote a bigger shift from air to rail? What do you think? Well, I, I think what the, the time is to promote a bigger shift uh, globally uh, for for to public transport and uh, and rail. Uh, basically, we have ten years to have uh, uh, an effect uh, on the, the carbon emission. And uh, uh, well, when you read the last IPCC report, it's absolutely clear that if we don't have an impact in the next ten years, we we'll have huge difficulties to at the global warming under 1.5 and perhaps even 2.0 uh, degrees Celsius. And the point is, is that we absolutely don't know what will happen in terms of uh, climatic events uh, if we uh, are uh, reaching uh, this, uh, this limit. So wh what I would say is that basically uh, in the next 10 or 15 years, have definitely uh, well I, I know that the world is not uh, this world is not really uh, very sexy but we have to have a quite frugal approach for transport we need to uh, to think really uh, as uh, it was uh, said by my colleagues from uh, OECD uh, and ITF uh, to think what is the best mode of transport for each occasion it's quite clear that we will continue to have flight if we want to go to Tokyo or or even Copenhagen uh, from from uh, from the south of Spain that will be very difficult to go there by, by train. So always be aviation and we also need cars. Uh, but what, what we need really is to uh, think what is the most frugal mode of transport and the most frugal attitude. And I think that it's uh, beyond uh, the change in, in terms of uh, behavior from, from the customer. We need to, uh, to have a system approach and to, to think collectively how to change uh, our behavior and to have the investment that will allow that uh, those uh, behavioral change uh, will be uh, not only possible, because they are possible. For instance, it's possible to have a model share for freight above fifty uh, percent. It's also possible to have a model share for rail that that is about uh, twenty thirty percent. I don't uh, obviously speaking of having rail everywhere. There is a possibility to have a model share for public transport that is higher than it is today. You have example in in many countries, but it's a question of organization of. Uh, uh, thinking to the transport paradigm and to have, uh, uh, as I said, innovation into uh, some digital tools, some to better interconnection, some better tarification, uh, to make this, um, let's say, frugal approach uh, desirable for our fellow citizens. I would take perhaps a very practical example uh, for, for rail, basically. I, I was in the COP last week and uh, Metro Rail met, met an event about uh, hydrogen trade. What was very interesting with this hydrogen train is that it was a train from the 70s that were that was basically upcycled to be to become uh, an hydrogen train. So that's a very fine solution to get rid of diesel train, which are mainly the emission of the sector to, um, in, uh, in, uh, in detail lines to shift them into hydrogen, and that is possible today. The technology is there today, and uh, to reuse uh, the existing uh, the existing vehicles. And I think that's a very important idea that we uh, need to have systems that should be more and more repairable, that should be scalable, and uh, that uh, should be able to deliver a very uh, good service to our customers uh, without uh, implying uh, carbon emission. First, to make those new products, because in in this case. Uh, 
well, so the train was the same, and uh, to uh, deliver uh, products that are up to date and with well, zero emission, as far as zero emission is something that is existing. Okay, so th th that for me, I'm sorry, I will be uh, forced to leave because I'm invited in another panel uh, in, in, in five minutes. Uh, sorry for that. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Francois, and uh, we are delighted to um, have you um, uh, with us. Um, so I, I just wanted to pick up on what has been already said. The words that our panelists use were choice, options, um, behavior. When we think about all this, I think it's undeniable that uh, you know, in, in, in most places these days, many of the traveling options, um, particularly when we think about aviation, are made without pricing in carbon emissions. And, and that's a very important point uh, to discuss um, as well. And uh, Yari, when you were talking about um, the decarbonizing air transport report, one of the recommendations that you have spelled out is that it's not only about international action. So of course it's very important that countries take part in the ICAO global process, but there is also a lot to be done domestically and regionally. So through the prism of carbon pricing, what do you think is important there? Thank you, Akoda. Um, I, I think I'd be perhaps repeating myself a little bit from the presentation I did. I, again, it's important we work together with ICAO on a global framework, common approach for mitigating the climate change impacts. Uh, but there is this urgency, and we know how difficult it is to come up with a global, uh, uh, really a ambitious agreement. So that is the kind of the my, my bridge to the point about the local measures, the national measures, and, and, and regional measures, even multilateral actions and bilateral actions. Um, I think beyond the ICAO's Corsia, uh, carbon prices can be introduced through different mechanisms, uh, carbon taxes on fuels, uh, market-based mechanisms, emission trading schemes. So there are multiple options through which we can move forward on that front. Um, we know international flights are exempt from fuel taxes in, in most cases, so perhaps the benefits of carbon pricing might make the this sort of uh, zero rate worth revisiting uh, in, in, in that discussion. I think uh, I also mentioned the point about including the technology policies. Uh, I think California is an interesting example that if you, if, you, if you have even moderate carbon pricing levels, but if you combine those with technology policies, that the policies support technology developments, for example, on low carbon fuel standards, you can actually achieve a lot and ac accelerate the development and update of the new technologies as well. Great, thanks very much, Yari. And Andreas, among these measures that have been mentioned by Yari, which do you think are the most promising ones? What are the challenges? Can I, can I just step back a, a little bit? Um, um, you, now you mentioned technology when, when you said before you said behavior and choice, but I think the most important one is technology and but technology may not be enough and then then we need to rely heavily on on the others and and you know with Kate's comments on perception or behavioral change I, I hope you're right Kate um, you know this this may however reflect a rather European, perspective as uh, flight shaming uh, supposedly is if you look at Australia for example I just still have this you know this this event in mind about these flights to nowhere during the pandemic where people would buy uh, you know airplane tickets you know be squeezed even in economies class get get the lousy meal and then be on a five-hour flight and arrive where they started from, just a round trip over Australia, just to experience the you know sensation of flight, or even more extreme in Singapore, where people you know are squeezed, to pay several hundred dollars for tickets just to board an airplane, get this food, watch a movie, and and get out of it again without even leaving the gate. Um, you know, uh, um, I'm 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 a bit more pessimistic in terms of you know how perceptions change at least on a global scale. Um, hopefully, um, you're right, Kate, and and you know the European uh, you know mindset propagates uh, you know through the rest of the planet. Now, in in terms of the question you actually asked, 
um, Jagoda. Um, well, carbon pricing would certainly be the, the most efficient uh, way of doing it. And, and I would be surprised if industry was against carbon pricing as long as it is predictable and, and they know, you know how the future looks in terms of the, the charges. Because then they can then plan and, and, and you know, uh, carry out these capital intensive investments that, that need to be done. And, and ideally it should be done on a, on a global scale. Um, if you try to introduce it on a country basis, then uh, you may do more, more things worse than, than better because there are leakage effects. Um, so for example, if France introduced uh, a carbon pricing regime, then the French airlines uh, would have to pay. And of course, those non-French airlines who fly to France would have to pay, but the airlines have the flexibility of, of moving the aircraft around in the fleet and they would only the, uh, operate the most fuel efficient aircraft in order to reduce these fees. And, and also, um, they may actually not fuel at all in, in France and, and uh, carry enough fuel with them in order to uh, be exempt of any charges that come with the fuel, which of course uh, would lead actually to a worsening effect. So, and, and, and the larger you draw this boundary in terms of carbon pricing, uh, the less these, these disbenefits occur and ultimately what you want is a, is a global scale. Uh, despite all these these uh, political challenges that come with it. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, Kate, Mark, uh, would you like to react to that? Um, perhaps starting with Kate? Yeah, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, carbon pricing has a, a, a certainly a role to play, an important role to play. Um, I mean, it remains the case that... Um, you know, even if uh, Corsia takes place successfully, uh, the large majority of emissions from global aviation uh, will still be uh, unpriced, <laughs> not taxed, not priced, nothing. Um, and, you know, I think quite clearly, just on a kind of common sense level, that, that, that just gives the wrong impression to people in terms of what is the cost, you know, the sort of true cost of, uh, of flying, um, and also fails to give you know, appropriate incentives to um, to uh, airlines to be um, making the sort of big expenditures that will be necessary to really radically change the kind of fuels or, or, or aircraft that are being used, and also um, in order to give uh, confidence to investors that uh, these these things are you know that there will be a market for some of these products. Um, I mean, at the same time, I think I think it's quite true to say that the industry and, and government in general are, are certainly supportive of the uh, of the principle of um, uh, of better carbon pricing for aviation. There is a risk, which is that um, the more expensive um, uh, sort of techn technologies are currently kind of so far away from the market that they're really not, they, they, they can't be, you know, you, you can't choose today um, as an air uh, traveler to, to uh, have the carbon from your uh, flights, you know, captured and, and removed through uh, greenhouse gas, or sort of permanent greenhouse gas removal. That's just not available to consumers. It's not available to airlines to do that because the, the, the technology is, is such, um, such a kind of nascent technology that some of these sort of big investments, therefore, at the moment look like they... Um, if they happen at all, will happen further down the line, and the stuff that's available now is much cheaper. So, so you know, SAF made from um, uh, SAF made from waste is, is kind of where the the conversations at really in in, in Europe at the moment, um, and that is the, the that much more expensive than kerosene, but nevertheless much less expensive than the sort of genuinely net zero uh, fuels and technologies that everyone says, oh, of course, at some point, we need these things to come into play. Um, so uh, yes, I certainly think that uh, national governments should be looking to uh, go, go further and go faster than, than what's happening at, uh, at the UN level. Um, and I think that, you know, the, the, the inclusion so far of, uh, of aviation in um, EU ETS for all its political controversy um, uh, ha has been more or less successful, you know, so I think these sort of fears about um, competitive distortions that will come about as a result of national and, and regional action are sometimes um, overplayed. And just as a kind of final comment, I suppose, you know, 
given that pretty much all uh, all, all countries, certainly uh, I would have thought all OECD countries are signed up to the same kind of long term uh, climate ambition under uh, under the Paris Agreement. We should expect that similar kinds of actions and costs and all the rest of it are going to fall on on all uh, countries at some stage. Um, so, you know, I, I, I would hope that actually, um, uh, you know, national action is a, is a good way of kind of stimulating progress where it's, it's not happening fast enough internationally. Thanks, Kate. And we'll go into the discussion of sustainable aviation fuels in a moment. But before we do that, I just wanted to ask you, Mark, if you um, would like to take a view on carbon pricing. Yes, thank you very much. Um, the first thing I want to say uh, is that, as you know, most of the airlines are proposing to offset the uh, CO2 emission of, of your flight. I know that there are criticisms on, on offsets. Uh, but first, there are certification uh, organiza organization uh, for offset, and then it's a way also to fund the reduction of CO2 emission across the world, because it's a good way, very often, to, to fund some project outside Europe, outside the Western countries, and to help uh, developing countries, managing countries to decarbonize. Second, yes, we need incentives. Uh, I think uh, EU ETS in Europe is uh, uh, some kind of carbon pricing because now uh, it's close to 60 euro per tons and it will probably very fast grow to 100 or even more. So it creates a, a carbon pricing in Europe. The benefit of the UETS is that on top of introducing carbon pricing, it, it, it gives a global approach of the objective of minus 55% in 2030. The fact that aviation is in the USTS scheme uh, means that uh, aviation will be part of the objective of minus 55% emission in 2030. So uh, we can see uh, on the other side of the Atlantic another way of incent incentivizing, uh, especially the use of SAF, with uh, tax credits, which is uh, a way of stimulating both demand and offer. Um, to make some uh, economic condition facilitating the switch, because you know that SAF is um, double price, triple price of today kerosene, and so to uh, support airlines in, in investing in this uh, new fuel, sustainable aviation fuel, with uh, a minimum level of reduction of CO2 emission to, to get this uh, tax credit. Um, it's, it's really encouraging, and we can see really uh, in the USA. Uh, fast uh, movements toward the uh, SAF with clear commitments of, of the airlines to uh, increase the uptake of SAF. In Europe, on the other side, you have the UATS, uh, and you also have a mandate on SAF. So from the policies, you, you have very different solutions. Um, the best would be to have so, some balance, and so some guidance at ICAO level on the way we want to incentivize uh, this movement to decarbonization, uh, on aviation. We know SAF is a solution, it has to be encouraged, there are different solutions. Uh, we know that technology has to be encouraged, there are different uh, level of investment and, and, and etc. So uh, I think there are different solutions uh, to incentivize uh, the, 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 the move to new technology or, or the move to, to new fuels. But from the time being, we see different approach. And I hope next year in ICAO with the assembly that we have to look at the uh, uh, targets of aviation for, for, for the future. Uh, there could be some agreements on the best way to manage this at global level, because it's easier, of course, when it's a uh, guarantee a level playing field and uh, there is no competitive issue. So if we can reach an agreement at ICAO, it will help, I think, to move faster and, and stronger on decarbonization. Indeed. Um, thank you very much, Mark. And you mentioned um, different ways in which uh, deployment of sustainable aviation fuels can be encouraged and increased. Going back to the ITF decarbonizing air transport uh, report, Yari, what other ways uh, there are to encourage new technologies to come on stream in time for us to achieve the decarbonization targets? Yeah, thank you. Um, first of all, very interesting comments and discussion by all the panelists. This is, this is highly interesting. Um, I, I think 
one of the things we looked at in in the report on decarbonizing aviation was looking at the barriers for SAF deployment, but also looking at short term and long term solutions and and, and actions going forward. Um, I think the first thing to say before we go to some of how we can encourage this, what we need is a clear policy framework that would help to de-risk the industry investments on new technologies. I think there's one one point for that. In terms of the in terms of the supporting and accelerating, I think or we need research, we need development, we need uh, deployment of, of new technologies, including SAF. Uh, this can be done two ways: uh, by providing funding for research. It's obviously one thing, and and second one is by providing government incentives for the take up of the new technologies by the sector. And these, these uh, support can come, I think, in many different forms. It's direct research grants. It can be uh, development of government research programs or on, on SAF uh, and uh, de-risking industry investments also in, in ramping up the production of, of these. And, and, and perhaps the, the qu big question, where do we get the funding from? Uh, and and, and for, for, the, for me at the moment, I could say two sources at least, and I'm sure other panelists have other, other thoughts on that. Uh, Obviously, these can be funded from government uh, general budgets, but also possibility with earmarked uh, revenue from carbon taxation. That's, that's another opportunity there. So I'd leave it there. Indeed, and, and thank you very much. And there's a related question uh, from the audience on production of uh, SAF, and it's easier to pick on panelists that are with us in the studio. So Yari already had a go, now it's your turn, Andreas. The question from the uh, floor is, Will we have enough sustainable aviation fuels by 2050? Well, it, it depends on, on, on two components. First of all, which, which aviation fuel are you looking at, which sustainable aviation fuel, and how quickly can you ramp it up? Um, so, so there are synthetic fuels um, that can be produced from, from biomass, from different types of biomass, and then you put different processes depending on the type of biomass. And there's a natural limitation, of course, and if you look at the you know, technical potential of uh, biomass that's available for energy uh, globally, then uh, you know, I only cite one study from the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis and the Global Energy Assessment. The range is 160 to 270 exajoules. Now, what, does, what do these numbers mean? World energy consumption is roughly 600 exajoules, so it's less than half. And, and there are many demands on these fuels from other sectors too. So if we look at you know, how the shipping industry plans to decarbonize, guess what? Biofuels are the number one option. Look at long distance trucking and the like. So, so that's a fuel or feedstock also in high demand. Then there are other fuels uh, that you also can produce, uh, the, the other synthetic fuels or the same synthetic fuels but from other feedstocks. And, and one option is to use hydrogen, but not directly, uh, to combine it with uh, carbon monoxide, and the carbon monoxide would come from CO2 from the atmosphere. You produce a so-called synthesis gas, you synthesize it into a uh, liquid fuel that has very similar properties to uh, you know, synthetic biofuels or to fossil jet fuels. There, the potential is essentially unlimited because the amount of renewable energy our planet receives is virtually unlimited, at least by the scale of consumption that we experience now and in the future. However, these processes, these so-called power to liquid uh, uh, processes, they, they only exist at the pilot uh, plant level. And, and as Yari articulated before, there's a challenge when you want to scale them up and you have to scale them up quickly. And, and um, I believe it, it depends on how quickly can you scale up these, these production processes in terms of scale and time and, and how much biofuel is, is there. Now, we, we looked into these, these options also, and um, the capital intensity of these power to liquids or a hydrogen economy in terms of direct use is several times larger compared to biofuel use. Um, because you need to invest in all these upstream electricity generation technologies. And if you wanted to pursue these, these pathways, um, um, if you, and, and if these fuels were, were introduced today or available today, then the electricity consumption would roughly be uh, around 30% of the total electricity consumption of our planet today. So that's a massive 
investment that has to happen, which again then suggests that we should have a very careful look at the biofuels, which of course also have some of the disadvantages or other disadvantages. Thank you very much, uh, Andreas, for this very comprehensive um, answer. We are almost out of time. It's five o'clock, uh, but the organizers are very keen on asking one last question to our panelists. One of the key purposes of having this forum is for the OECD to identify future areas of work. So the question is, what are key knowledge gaps that the OECD and the ITF should be looking at uh, to help decarbonize the aviation sector. Um, if maybe in one, two sentences, if you could just give us one idea on what we should be looking at. Yari is exempt because he's from the ITF, uh, so, so you can sit this one out. But if I could ask uh, um, Kate, Mark, and then Andreas about your ideas of what we should be looking at. Okay, I'll try and speak quickly. <laughs> so I think first, uh, the question of how do we internalize the cost of uh, aviation decarbonizing, potentially including uh, the need for carbon removals into ticket prices. I think lots of people accept that in principle. I think the question of how we make it happen uh, it, it is difficult to answer. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone said anything about non-CO2 impacts. We need to look at how to give the non-CO2 um, warming impacts of flying appropriate weight in, in, in policy, including those generated by new technologies and fuels. Um, uh, 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 we need to look at um, what the appropriate targets might be for things uh, like SAFs. Uh, as we've heard, there are uh, lots of, uh, there's lots of competition for things like land and renewable energy. Um, so I think we need to be quite careful about how we're accounting for uh, the, the, what we get from those fuels. Um, and then maybe finally, uh, I think there are questions to be asked actually on the sort of um, more on the social science side, maybe. So how, how responsive would the public be to uh, messaging around the, the, the need to limit aviation demand for climate reasons if they had a better understanding about what the climate impact of, of a flight was? Um, I think that's that whole question of sort of public information is something that hasn't been explored well enough. Thank you very much, uh, Kate. Many ideas there, and we've jotted all of them down. Mark, over to you. Thank you very much. I think we have seen during this panel that uh, we have two critical uh, issues uh, to achieve a fully decarbonized aviation. The one is pure technology, uh, and I think this is in our hands, uh, aircraft manufacturers, and we are quite confident that we'll be able to deliver the, the, the technology to go to uh, a fully decarbonized aviation. But on the other side, we need new fuels, decarbonized fuels, sustainable aviation fuel or hydrogen. And I think this is where we, we have to work all together. And this is not only for aviation, as I said, it's for, for, for the global transport and also for the global economy. So for me, the, the main focus should be on the development of new uh, fuels, sustainable aviation fuel coming from biomass or uh, electrical fuels, P2L, but also hydrogen. We do believe that uh, the key element for the future for aviation is for the rest of the transport and the rest of the economy is, uh, is the development of a uh, decarbonized hydrogen production. We can see a massive uh, shift to that uh, through the Hydrogen Council and in many countries, but I think that it has been said we need to accelerate the investment, uh, probably also uh, be innovative in the technology to deliver enough uh, new fuels, especially uh, decarbonized fuel for the future. And this is probably the main challenge we have ahead of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And indeed, we have plans of looking precisely in some of these issues that you mentioned there. So we will keep you posted on that, definitely. And the last word belongs to you, Andreas. Thank you. Now, what, what has not been said yet, um, well, o over the years, you know, the ITF has built a really impressive uh, set of multimodal models, one for passenger and, and the other one for freight, and, and, and with a significant spatial resolution. And I think that puts you into a un unique position that you can look at the aviation sector, but also in conjunction with the other modes. And, and, and shed some more light and clarity about what is the potential for you know, high-speed rail 
uh, um, you know, air substitution on a global scale. Um, you know, if we look at, at the advent of, uh, or at the eventual introduction of automated vehicles uh, on, on the ground, hopefully battery electric, you know, what would be, uh, or what could be consumer preferences compared to short distance air travel and, and, and the like. So, so, so there, there are a number of, of uh, you know, interrelated uh, model issues that the ITF would be extremely well positioned, if not uniquely positioned, to look at. Thank you um, very much, Andreas. And I think uh, what you said there on high-speed rail would be echoed by Francois if he still was um, uh, with us um, uh, um, on the panel. And with these strong messages on what uh, the future work priorities should be, uh, I would like to conclude this session. Thank you very much, Andreas, Kate, Francois, Jane, Yari, and Mark for your excellent contributions uh, to the debate. And uh, I would like to finish this session um, uh, by um, reminding all of you that this is not the end uh, of the GGSD uh, forum. Tomorrow we will reconvene at two o'clock Paris time for our last final session on tracking and analyzing green recovery measures. So I very much encourage you uh, to attend this final session and also listen to the closing uh, remarks. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers again for inviting the ITF to moderate uh, this session. Uh, see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.